very good morning to you. My name is uh, Tim Blackman, and I come to you uh, as the chaplain of Wheaton College. I've been a minister in the Christian Reformed Church for about 24 years. We were church planters in California, my wife and I, and our four children were born there. And then we moved from the Sacramento area to uh, the Netherlands, which is where I'm from originally. I was born and raised in The Hague, the Netherlands, and I served uh, the church I grew up in there for seven years bef- before receiving um, the call to serve as Wheaton's sixth chaplain. It is uh, a privilege to be here with you and to open the scriptures. Uh, why don't we ask God for his blessing? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the way you speak, you have spoken the entire universe into being. With the word you spoke and the world came to be, and you showed your power and your authority and your might and your supremacy. And you have spoken not only through the prophets, but you have spoken ultimately once and for all through your son, the living word. And we pray it is his word that we would hear this morning. And we pray that by the strength and power of your Holy Spirit, you would minister to us so that all our speaking would be careful and life-giving, stewarded under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would speak through the reading from Proverbs and from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Speak, Lord, we, your children, are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would turn in your Bible to the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, and I will read verses 1 through 21. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. When wickedness comes, contempt comes also, and with dishonor comes disgrace. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. It is not good to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the righteous of justice. A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. Whoever slack in his work, is a brother to him who destroys. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. A rich man's wealth is... Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, but humiliation comes before honor. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. A man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. An intelligent heart acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. The lot puts an end to quarrels and decides between powerful contenders. A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. Let me read that last verse again. Death and life 
are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Also, if you would turn to Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, chapter 4, and I will read from verse 17 to the end of the chapter. Now, this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And listen carefully to these verses, starting in 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. The thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. This is the word of the Lord. I still remember his large farming hands, grubby with dirt under his nails. I remember his signature overall. He always wore the blue jeans overall. It seemed to be his only outfit, almost like a uniform. And I remember the dingy black t-shirt, also a part of his daily attire his bushy beard, and his coffee and cigarette breath. I'll never forget it. My math teacher in the ninth grade had noticed uh, that my success as a student was, shall we say, deferred. And I'll never forget the day when, with a great deal of exasperation, he had my math test results in his hand. And as he was handing out grades, and at the time, this was in the Netherlands, and I don't know if they do this in America in in high school, but at the time when you got an exam back, everybody in the class knew what kind of grade you were going to get. And he, he held up my exam for everyone to see, and he looked at me in front of the entire class of 23 students, and he said, Tim Blackman, You are the worst student I have ever had, and you will never amount to anything. Now, what he was referring to was my math exam, of course, and I know that in the U.S., the the grading goes from A to F. And in the Netherlands, it actually goes from zero to 10. So zero is that you get nothing, and 10 would be like an A+. Somehow, don't ask me how, but somehow I had managed to get a minus three. (laughs) It, it, It is the European equivalent of getting 
the results on an exam back and your professor has invented a new letter of the alphabet. A minus three. I don't know, maybe I got all the extra credit wrong as well. But what I remember is not so much the minus three, but those stinging words to me. Tim Blackman, you are the worst student I have ever had and you will never amount to anything. My, my father had similar words spoken over him. Uh, he had noticed that uh, only the members of the glee club in his eighth grade were the students that would get to travel beyond the boundaries of Raleigh, North Carolina. This is in the early 1930s. As a black man, as a young black man, he didn't have a lot of opportunities, but for some reason, he felt an itch to move away, to, to broaden his horizons, and it was the glee club that was the ticket. The only problem was that outside of singing once in a while at First Baptist Church of Raleigh, North Carolina, he'd actually never opened his mouth and have a musical bone in his body, and so he auditioned. I remember him telling the story about how when he auditioned, he had heard Cab Calloway's song, Yes, I Heard, on the radio. And he decided to try to imitate it, except that it was monotone, and he couldn't remember the melody line. And after he sang his first audition, the choir director looked at him and said, Henry Blackman, don't you ever dare open your mouth again and sing. The great irony in my father's life is that he spent the better part of six decades as a professional singer, choir director, music teacher, opera singer, performed all over the world. Now, before you draw the, draw the wrong conclusions and you think that every eighth and ninth grade teacher is an ogre and an abusive educator, there is a little bit of a detail that I have to tell you, particularly about my math teacher, because there is another part of the story that I haven't told you. The months preceding the infamous minus three math exam, uh, I had been uh, teasing my teacher uh, not to his face, of course, I wasn't quite that courageous, but behind the scenes, behind his back, I had been spreading rumors about him. I had been making fun of him. I was making fun of his weight. He was rather a large man. I was making fun of the fact that he was a farmer, and of course, we were all city slickers. If you lived outside of our zip code, then you were a farmer, and that was a derogatory term. We made fun of his hands because they were always dirty. And part of that was dirt because I think he was a hog farmer. And part of that was the fact that he smoked and he always had yellow stains and he always had, he was grungy. And so I made fun of him. And I also explained that while my math success may have been deferred, there were reasons why his marriage was deferred. And these were the rumors that I spread about him. Again, not to his face, but behind his back. I teased him, I had ridiculed him, and I am convinced that he had begun to hear and did not know how to retaliate. So when he said those words, Tim Blackman, you have never amounted to anything, he was simply retaliating. He was, do he was at his wits, and I am sure, I am convinced of it, that, that all the words that I had spoken indirectly under my breath had made an impact on him. I had created a world with my words in that classroom. And my words had shaped the way every student in that classroom looked at our math teacher. And it sucked the life out of him. I can't even imagine what it must have been like for that man to go home at the end of the day and to have someone like me in his classroom. I don't know how much you know about the book of Proverbs, but Proverbs is, as they say, a reality-based phenomenon. Uh, Proverbs is not a, a list of 10 tips and 7 techniques for how to get your life together, but it's basically a reality-based phenomenon that says, if you look at the world, if you observe the world, if you are discerning and wise, 
you will see that this is the way the world works. Pay attention to it. If you have eyes to see, if you have ears to hear, you will notice that this is the way the cookie crumbles. Here is the grain of the universe. Here is the way the world works. Pay attention to it. And if you pay attention to it, and if you adjust your life accordingly, you will be wise. And so in our passage that we read today in chapter 18, the last verse that I had read, the psalmist is saying, if you, if you pay attention to your language, if you pay attention to your words, you will notice that your words have the power to create life. Every time you speak, you can speak in the same ways or similarly to the way that God created the entire world. With the words that you speak, you create life all around you. Pay attention to this. this the author of Proverbs is saying, you can speak life with your words, with your language, with your comments. But your words also have the power of death. You have the ability just with your mouth to discourage and to debilitate, to ridicule and to gossip and to slander. We can build up and you can encourage, you can build into a community, you can create worlds of joy and possibility and peace and creativity, or you can tear down and destroy one sentence at a time, one syllable at a time. Have, have you ever noticed the power of words? Earlier uh, this week, I had a chance to talk uh, to your, your pastor, Derek, I wanted to find out a little bit more about you. And, and of course, like I, I do this all the time too, when we get guest preachers to, to come to Wheaton, there are some things I don't want them to say. And Pastor Derek on Monday morning when we talked, he said, yeah, there's some things you probably don't want to talk about. Do you realize, do you, this is, you think I'm going to go rogue here on you. <laughs> but you realize that in my next sentence, I could say something that would so offend you, that would create trouble and turmoil, not only for you, but for Pastor Derek, and um, certainly I wouldn't get invited back again. There are some things that I could say right now that could, that could make me lose my job. You realize that? This is the power of words. Do you realize that you have a God-given tool that is so powerful that you have the ability to either breathe life and encouragement and joy and peace into the person sitting next to you, or at the end of the day, at the end of this service even, you can say something that will so discourage and will so wound the person that you love the most. I don't know if you've ever noticed all the things that you can do with words. What, what, what are some things that you think we can do with words? What do we use words for? Praise. Encouragement. Teaching, education. Poetry. Singing. Manipulation, yes. I don't know if you've ever noticed when the politicians begin to speak and they aim their words not at, oh, I, he told me not to talk about politics. <laughs> and they aim the words not at your brain but at your belly because there are promises, there are things that they want you to do. They want you to vote for the man or for the woman. Oh, the words are powerful. What else do we do with words? Shame condemn. What else? Love. Yes, lie, lift up, falsehood, and so on. And you see, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. All the things that we can do with words, the power of the tongue. We advertise with words. We can titillate with words. We can entice with words. A few weeks ago, I was talking to a father who had adopted a a young son from Ukraine. And this young son born with uh, lots of physical deformities and challenges. And I remember when he said that when he spoke the words to his son on his 16th birthday, and I didn't, they didn't know that he was going to live that long. And he looked at his son and he said, Son, 
from before you were born, the day that we found out what your name was going to be, I have loved you, and it is the great joy and privileges of, of my life to be your father. And you can see the sparkle in the young man's eyes because those words have breathed life into this young man. Think of how, how different you, you feel when you're... you're your manager or your boss or your supervisor calls you into the office and says, you know, I, we really need to have a talk. And you wonder about the words that she is going to speak next. Is it going to be, you are fired? Or is it going to be, Tim, we have lost confidence in your ability to perform your duties as required? Or is it going to be, I just thought you needed to know that we are grateful to have you here and you are making a significant contribution. We are grateful for you. Thank you. This is the power of words. Uh, because the book of Proverbs is a reality-based phenomenon, uh, I want you to take a look for a moment at verse 6. I'm going to give you just a few examples as to how this works. Look, for example, at verse 6. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. Oh, no, that's verse 4. It is uh, verse 6. A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. Now, this reminds me of a conversation I had with my 10-year-old and 13-year-old sons. Your kids probably don't do this, but when, when my youngest two boys play together, and it could be anything, it could be a board game, it could be basketball or football or lacrosse or tennis or baseball or whatever they decide to do this afternoon. They are so fiercely competitive that sometimes it seems like both of them break the rules and cheat. And uh, just, just last week, Saturday night, I could overhear them. I was upstairs on the third floor of our house, and they are in the backyard, and they are screaming at each other. You were in. I was not. You were out. I was not. And they are going back and forth at each other. They have been at each other's neck. And every play, it seems, is a contested play. And I said, okay, either you need to get glasses, but why can't, I said to them, why can't you play nicely? And then I reminded them of Proverbs 18, 6. A fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are a snare to his soul. He walks into his mouth. And I said, there is going to be a day when you will not play with your brother who by now is pretty used to your cheating and your bad play calling. But there's going to be a day where you will be on a playground and if you pull the same nonsense that you are pulling yourself right now, you are going to get in deep weeds. And you will know when it happens because there will be somebody on that playground who does not like the way you call the game. So watch your mouth. If you pay attention to the way the world works, you know that this is wise. And if you've been to some of the playgrounds that I've been to, you know that I'm not lying. Look also in verse 8. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. The words of the whisperer. Now, I, I know, Pastor Derek told me, that no one ever at Orland Park CRC could be accused of gossiping. I mean, I know this is, the, this is the one church where it simply does not happen. You do not gossip about him. You do not gossip about the elders or the deacons, about the worship pastor. It, it simply does not happen. And so just use your imagination for a moment uh, and imagine a, a church or a community or a business or a school where there are whisperers. Whisperers are people who whisper words behind the scenes. Let me give you an example. Imagine this. So Pastor Derek's not here. And I think there's something you need to know about him. <laughs> he says that he went to Calvin Seminary for a while. And I looked into his academic record. And I don't think he's who you think he is. Uh, I, looked at, I, wrote, I read some of his papers. And as far as I could tell, 
in my educated opinion, they were plagiarized. Now, don't tell them I said this. <laughs> and I'm only sharing this with you as a prayer request. <laughs> Whisperers always share things as prayer requests. But I just thought you needed to know, watch out. Now, okay, I'm giving this crazy example of spreading a rumor about your... But notice something. Notice, notice what happens now in my relationship with Pastor Derek. He doesn't know, I don't know if this is being recorded or if he's listening to a live stream or not, but he doesn't know that I have said this. But at some point, I realize that he may discover that I have spread a rumor. I have whispered behind his scenes, behind his back. Now my relationship with him is tense. I've not breathed life into my relationship with him. Uh, we can no longer trust each other because I know it is just a matter of time until some of you whispers to him what I said here on Sunday morning. And it is going to affect my relationship. But something else happens. Not only is my relationship with Pastor Derek changed, your relationship with Pastor Derek has changed because even though you think he is a man of God and he is educated and you think that he probably did go to school and he probably didn't plagiarize his papers, you are now wondering, maybe, there, you know, that one time he sounded eerily familiar to something I heard on the radio. And he doesn't know why you are now giving him the cold shoulder. He doesn't, he doesn't know what's going on, but your relationship with him has changed. And something else has happened. My relationship with you has changed. Because you know that if I am going to speak about a man of God this way, what's going to keep me from talking about you in the same way when I see fit? Oh, the words of a whisperer. And they, the, the book of Proverbs gets it just right. It is like a, it is like a sweet morsel. It is so tasty because you, the words are on the tip of your tongue. You want to say something. You can't, you can't help it. The words of gossip, they, they have got to come out. You can't help yourself. Oh, it's so juicy, that piece of gossip. I shared with you in the name of Jesus for the second prayer for my brother or sister. But man, did you hear about their divorce? Can you believe they lost their house? Do you know why he lost his job? The words of a whisperer. I want you also to look with me at the way Paul structures his argument. It's the same, the same way Paul always teaches us. Usually at the beginning of a letter, he will explain to us all Jesus has done for us. And if you look at Ephesians chapter 1, I mean, you can pick almost any chapter from chapters 1 through 4, and you will hear this beautiful, exultant doxology of all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. I mean, listen, listen to how he begins. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And for the next couple of chapters, he is explaining what all those blessings in the heavenly places in Jesus really are like. He goes in great detail, and he's almost at a loss for words. He says, do you see what Jesus has done? Do you see what God has done for you? He's chosen you. He's elected you. He has redeemed you. He has placed you with Jesus in the heavenly places. I mean, he, he's almost at a loss for words. And then usually later on, in these books, in these letters to these churches, he says, now, because of what Jesus has done, go live this way. Because of the redeeming power of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of the life-changing power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, now let Jesus be the telling influence of your life. And then we get to verse 25, therefore... And he gives us three things. He says, first of all, those of you who steal should no longer steal. You should, you should work with your hands so that you can help people who are in need. His second argument is this. Those of you who are lying, those of you who speak falsehood, you should start speaking the truth. And then he says, those of you who have corrupting talk come out of, the, of, out of your mouths should instead speak words that bring life and grace that are edifying. Now look at that word. Let no corrupting talk. The word he's using actually is the word for rotting fruit or rotting garbage. I don't know, I don't know where your 
garbage can is located in your house. But you know how, particularly in a hot, muggy, humid summer day, about six days after you have had chicken on the grill, and there are chicken juices in the bottom of the trash can, and it gets hot, and there's some rotten fruit in there, and maybe some spilled milk, and you know, you know the odor I'm talking about, right? And if, if, your, if, your garage, if, if your garage is the place where your garbage can is standing, you cannot wait to get it out. You, you, wanna, you want to rid yourself of the odor. You cannot, you cannot wait to put it to the curb because you want to be done with that filth. Paul says, let no filthy, let no rotting words come out of your mouth. He says, and these, this is a great line of questioning that you can follow. Are the words that I am going to speak, will they, be, will they build someone up? Will they be edifying? And it is literally this idea that your words build an edifice. They build a building. It is a construction project. And so if you begin thinking of your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter, or your teacher or your student as your construction project. As you well know, your construction project has architectural plans. You have a design in mind. Well, what is the design that I have in mind for my spouse or for my child or for my student or for my employee? What kind of building do you want to build up? Paul says, because of what Jesus has done now, build one another up. So the question is, am I building someone up or am I tearing them down? Are my words a means of grace? Paul says, do they give grace to those who hear or do they suck the life out of them? And he says, do they fit the occasion? Uh, I've been married, um, ooh, give or take, 24 years. And uh, for the first few years when I would say something that was inappropriate or not fitting, not carefully discerned, my wife would say something. How many of you, your wives say something to you? After a while, she no longer needs to say anything. Now I just get the look. She just raises her eyebrow. And I, it could be anything from, please stick to the script, don't improvise, don't run your mouth. And then there's that other look that's, that I think I interpreted more as like, oh, Jesus, take the wheel. Please guide this conversation because I do not like where he's going with this. And I know that oh, she doesn't even, and the, it is a reminder of me to only speak those words that are fitting because it takes careful discernment. You create worlds with the words that you speak. And I wonder what would happen if all of us would begin to understand that the power of life is in the tongue. And that if Jesus indeed is going to be the telling influence over our lives, that we would commit to only speaking those words that are edifying and encouraging and life-giving, words that bring peace, words that build worlds of joy and happiness and grace and gratitude in the communities we live in, the families that we have. You know, in closing, one of the things that I was reminded of uh, in the south part of the Netherlands, in a town of Maastricht, there is a, a convent. It's called the nunnery. And the nunnery has been a language training school for business people. So if you're American and you are sent over by your company to the Netherlands and they want you to have some base level of understanding of the Dutch language, uh, which with all its guttural sounds, is not the easiest to pronounce, admittedly. Uh, they send you to the nunnery, and you can either go for two weeks, for three months, or for six months. And here is their, here's the method. And I, I have met people who've been to the nunnery, and I've been amazed at their ability to speak a foreign language. And here's, what, here's, how, here's how they do it. You show up day one. Sir, do you speak Dutch? Not a word. Okay, so they would take you, and... The first day you get there, and you get there at about lunchtime, and they would say, from now on, for the rest of your two weeks, three months, six months, you will no longer speak in English, think in English, 
phone in English, email in English, or write in English. Dutch only for you. And it begins right now. And this is what they call their complete immersion method. And it is amazing how after this complete immersion in all things Dutch, after two weeks, three months, or six months, people come out speaking their foreign language fluently. It is only when we are deeply immersed in the finished work of salvation, it is only when we are saturated with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ every day that you and I will become fluent in the language of grace. And it is my prayer that Orland Park CRC will become like the nunnery, that you will be so immersed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and all the benefits that come with it, that his life and his love and his powerful speech becomes the telling influence of your lives and that you would speak grace fluently. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for the words that you've spoken to us. Uh, we pray that you that you 